All right, I want to welcome everyone to the panel room. Uh, we've got a new panel going today. Uh, this is all about uh, police procedurals and how to write them. And I'm just going to go around uh, the horn and ask people to introduce themselves. Uh, start with Steve. All right, you asked why we're on the panel, and I was like, I don't write procedurals, but I was in the Navy for four years, the Army for two, and then I was on a police department for almost 30. I'm retired from there. I was on 14 years on the SWAT team and uh, nine of those as a sniper. So I guess that's why I was asked to be here. And so I, when I see things get them wrong, it's like, oh, I hate that. So I am a writer also, but I write sci-fi fantasy. I haven't written a police procedural. Well, you've got the, the legs there with the, your information. So uh, how about Hope? I, I write mystery. And they're not all police procedurals, but uh, I write two series, Carolina Slade Mysteries and the Edisto Island Mysteries. But uh, I'm on the panel because I do write mysteries and I am married to a retired federal agent and we met on a bribery investigation. I was offered, I was a fed, federal employee offered a bribe. He was one of the agents on the case, you know, and you know, 18 months later we were married, but <laughs> A little bit of a scandal in there, but we 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 have fun. He's my go-to technical advisor, so I think that's why I'm on the panel. Exactly, and uh, Jean. Well, I'm Jeannie Adams, and I write uh, romantic suspense with a lot of things that go boom. Uh, I write urban fantasies with a lot of things that go boom. Uh, I also teach a class on body disposal for writers because uh, I spent 13 years in the funeral business and cemetery business, and so. Uh, I see it get butchered a lot in books. So I started teaching a class on how to get rid of the body. All right, great. Uh, now, to start off, I wanna, for the people that don't understand what a police procedural is, I went over to BookBub, decided to look up their definition, uh, which is police procedurals are gripping page turners that explore the ins and outs of everyday life on the police force as those in blue fight crime and seek justice. These books can often be gritty. Anyone want to add anything to that? <laughs> I just well, there's love usually that. a lot of bodies hitting the floor, too. Exactly. Well, it's, I mean, it, it's kind of like takes a mystery from beginning to end through a cop's eyes. You know, it, it, to me, that's it in a nutshell when I think of police procedural. Great. Uh, now, to start off, uh, I got some questions from Facebook. Uh, I've got Michael Williams asking a question. And I'll throw this out to um, all of you guys, uh, actually. Uh, but in detective fiction, uh, they often have the private investigator or the amateur sleuth interacting very closely with the cops all the time. Is this accurate? Uh, I guess uh, start with Steve. No, it's not. <laughs> I know it makes for good TV and good page turning, um, and but it it is absolutely not. There's no, and I, I'm I'm coming from a police department of 1800 sworn. Smaller departments I can't speak about, but uh, departments our size, you know, no, um, especially on the investigative side, it's just not going to happen. Um, the the your your small PI is not going to have the resources that a large police department has any way, shape, or form. And uh, a professional police department is also going to have its own set of, you know, you've got your vice unit, they've got their CIs, um, which are confidential informants, and you'd be hard pressed as a PI to have one, some of them better than a, a good vice unit. So, but it still does make good, I get it, it does make for good, <laughs> good pros and, you know, it makes for great TV. So. All right. Uh, Hope, anything to add on that? Well, and I think you have to look at more than just local local PDs, too, because my first series is in the federal sector. Mm -hmm. And so, no, you wouldn't have a PI, but you might have someone who's... I was a special projects representative with the federal government, and so I handled cases that were questionable up until the point I could tell they were criminal. And at that point, I passed it over to the IG, the, the Inspector General's office, uh, the CID. 
and uh, you know, there was a lot of times I I did work hand in hand. So it not necessarily a private investigator, but but you're there as a civilian, still working side by side with a, a federal agent. Now, my uh, second series is on a, on an island where it's got a six man PD. So you know, everybody does everything and takes where information from wherever they can get it. Uh, so I. I'm attempting a third series that does involve a PI and it's causing me to do a lot of research and a lot of leaping from getting the information to dealing with law enforcement because it's just not as slick as a lot of television shows show. All right, and does it make a difference, uh, cause this is kind of a follow up of his, if the PI is former law enforcement uh, like I believe your husband, Hope, is? He's federal, yeah. Uh, does, it, does it matter? That, I'm, I'm not sure I caught the question. The, you're saying that the interaction doesn't really happen uh, the way it shows in TV. Is there more of a likelihood if that private investigator or the amateur used to be law enforcement, even though probably in the different area of law enforcement? I think it does. And that's the reason when I'm writing my PI, she used to be FBI. You know, I, I, you know, it just, it just made her more credible. And of course she moves back home and her uncle's the sheriff. So, you know, she just eat up with law enforcement all around her, but, and, and she had a background that came from it. So, you know, I, I wanted to have as much credibility as possible knowing in real life, you don't have somebody who's been a PI for their whole life walk in and work hand in hand with a detective at the local PD. That's, I'm not aware of that happening. Former law enforcement will always help. And a lot of, a lot of guys and gals retire and become PIs. Um, so that well, actually my bit. husband retired uh, and then immediately thought, I'm going to give this a shot. It took about two years where he's like, no. <laughs> Yeah, I see, I've seen that a lot too. So it, you know, that would give them a lot of credibility that they've at least, you know, they've developed those kind of resources and the, you know, the relationships with the, within the PD. They're still not going to conduct the investigation. It's like uh, Hope said, they're going to turn it over to, if they come up with something that's truly criminal, um, they're, you know, they're going to go in there and turn it over to the detectives and let the detectives do their thing. Same thing with the feds. You're going to turn it over to the feds, let them do their thing. You know, you'll be, you know, you'll be a witness um, and could be a very integral part of the witness program, but you're not going to be conducting an investigation at that point. Right. All right. And as a former locksmith, I've watched way too many shows where someone sticks a little pin in and wiggles it and all of a sudden the door opens. It makes me cringe every time I see it. Uh, so. I want you guys to give me your pet peeve in book, film, television that you see constantly that you're just like, that's not the way it is. And I'll start with you, Jeannie. Well, one of my biggest pet peeves is the use of the word coffin versus the word casket. Uh, coffin is an eight-sided Dracula box. We don't use them anymore. A uh, casket is what we use now. Uh, my other pet peeve is uh, anybody shown digging a grave with a shovel <laughs> and it takes them, oh, a couple hours. No. <laughs> and last but not least, anybody burying a body in Maine in January, which I've seen done like three times on television. I'm like, nope, <laughs> not a backhoe made. So all the supernatural episodes where they have to dig up the body, I'm just, you know, devastated now. I know. Um, I know. Every time I watch it, I'm like, oh, especially if it's like 30 years old, you're not digging it. It maybe six hours, seven hours, you could get down that far, but not in a perfect square. Like, you know. <laughs> all right, Hope. Uh, mine tends to gravitate more toward the federal level. When I see anything that's centered around the FBI, uh, it's like sci-fi. It's <laughs> it, it, they show them having way more emotion than they normally do, and a way more latitude. Uh, 
you know, they're pretty tightly reined in. Uh, they just, they don't go out there and just free for all take one clue to another, to another, to another, and catch a flight here. And, you know, it, it just is a little much to swallow to watch how they present the FBI. It's just not even close. And Steve? We don't have enough time. Um, <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll give you, I'll, I'm going to, I'll take you back off of um, hope. The, the things that bother me about when, especially with the feds is the, the perceived that there's, there's always this friction between local law enforcement and F, you know, federal. We have multi-jurisdictional task forces running all the time. It just doesn't happen. We have our role, they have their role. Um, and usually it works very seamlessly. Um, that's, that's a, a big one. I, and what she said about, uh, everybody's pretty reined in because we have to go to court. And if you, you know, run off the rails, you're going to lose it in court. There's just no way it just won't happen. A good lawyer will come in here and just say, you know, everything will get thrown out. The other thing is, is with, especially on the federal side to see, um, the agent in charge being 25 years old. Um, yes. That just, it just doesn't happen. You have to, we're, we're all of us, we're all in an organization of seniority. And the only way to do that is put your time in. And, you know, you're not going to come in there with uh, a four year degree and a couple of months on and be working first shift in, you know, in New York. It's just not going to happen. You're on third shift, you know, someone's got to count the scene or whatever happens on. That's what's happened. And I could go on and on. So I'll stop there and let you. Well, I, I, can, I can add a, a little one that just is a pet peeve of mine is them calling each other by their rank, you know, senior special agent Brown, you know, and, and, they're, and they, they work together. <laughs> that just sounds so phony. <laughs> yes. All right. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, no, I was just agreeing with her, you know, usually for the military, it's last names, um, but there's going to be a nickname. You know, uh, I was, you know, with a last name of Murphy, um, there can be all kind of different things. The Irish cop, the, the Irish, you know, the British, when I was over there at one point working on it, has to call me Spud because I was Irish and, you know, potato farmer kind of thing, even though I've never dug a potato in my life. So, yeah, we don't call each other special agent so and so or anything. All right. Now, short of going into law enforcement or marrying into law enforcement, what can the average person do to improve their realism with writing these police procedurals? Read, you know, read a lot of them <laughs> and see what other people are doing and the ones that sound reasonable. Find some friends, family members who are in law enforcement. You know, there are a bunch. Ask questions. Um, I get asked questions. We do, a, the guy I write with, we do a lot of movies. We write, and I get asked a lot. We write screenplays for the most part. And I get asked, well, this guy has a revolver. Would he have a revolver this day and age? Probably not as a personal carry weapon, you know. And um, so you get, so ask. You know, people, it's not a, they're, they're, we don't have a bunch of secrets laying around. If you want to know, we'll tell you. Most of it will say it depends, but, you know, and it does depend. So that's my two cents. I think that law enforcement is pretty open about answering questions, too. I've not seen there being much, you know, hold back, keeping it close to the chest. It's secrets. You know, I, I, don't, I don't see any of that. I think they're pretty open uh, about you tell them I'm a writer, I'm writing this book and I've got this scenario, can, can I run it by you? I think most any of them would, they, they'd listen. That's what I've found. I mean, you find the public relations person for whatever city or county or town you're setting the book in and ask them if they've got someone you can talk to. Uh, that's worked for me. And they want you to get it right, uh, as, as uh, Steve and Hope have both said, they'd prefer you got it right. <laughs> As it, so that they've been very helpful. Now I will tell you that one of the first books I ever wrote uh, that was published with Kensington in New York, um, I talked to a guy who was a 
pilot and flew in Afghanistan uh, stealth helicopters. And I set the scene the way he told me it would work. And my editor would not keep it because she said that they, that a reader would not believe it because of the way they showed it on television. So sometimes even when you get it right, you have to edit it. <laughs> I had not expected that, but I can see why. Um, okay. Now, Gina, this one specifically for you, since you do a workshop, um, what is it called? Mauled Men, Drowned Dames, and Crispy Critters? That's the body disposal workshop for writers. So what did you do to prepare that and to create it? Uh, what did you have to do to get that information? Well, my first husband was a funeral director and his family owned a cemetery. So I worked there before I met him, I met him and married him and then put him through school, mortuary school, which meant basically I went through mortuary school and then spent 13 years in the business before we split up. So uh, I got to know a lot about the business. And of course, I was curious about it being a writer and uh, got to know a lot of that area. So uh, my sweet revenge is to uh, teach this class. And Hope, I saw both of your series, you know, one's a federal investigator, uh, the main character, I believe, and the other one is a Boston detective. Being two different series, is there, why, <laughs> why did you go federal on one and more, you know, local, I guess, on the other? Uh, is well, there the a reason? Yeah. Well, it's, it, that's, it'll make more sense once I tell it. <laughs> um, the first one was basically the job I did. And then she was involved in, you know, the federal sector very, um, pretty heavily. So that one was a little bit easier to write. I actually wrote it in first person. Uh, the second series, my publisher came to me and said, we want you to diversify. And since you've got a quasi amateur sleuth, uh, since she, you know, doesn't carry a badge, uh, then we want her to be a real cop or somebody in law enforcement. And they gave me three conditions, somebody in law enforcement, your favorite place in South Carolina for the setting for all the books, and a lot of family angst, Southern family angst. And I'm like, uh, okay. Um, <laughs> and I came up with this series, uh, but I wanted, coming to Edisto Beach, right now in reality, they have a, a, a seven man police force, okay? And you know, you can imagine the biggest thing they do is pull over golf carts for speeding. And, and that's fine, that's all well and good. You'll notice most of the people are right out of the academy or that's their last leg before they retire. It's, it's funny when you look at all, all of them there. Um, so I, I wanted somebody who was, I don't want to say a cut above, but was well, that stood out as a little bit of an oddball. So I, she's Southern, despite her deeply Southern parents, she married a guy in Boston who was with the US Marshal Service, and then she was a homicide detective with Boston PD. He died uh, um, of, by some, the hands of some nefarious characters, and she comes back home to kind of heal from it after she kind of blew her career trying to find out who the hell did it. Scar sorry. Um, so that's the reason I, I, I did it that way. I wanted somebody totally different, and I wrote her in third person just so she would sound nothing like my other protagonist. And then now that I've got 11 books out with those series, I, I want to do something different. So I'm attempting a PI. Yeah, good. Uh, now, we've talked about adding realism, but some authors I know can take that way, way too far. So do you have any suggestions or tips or anything on how to avoid going down the rabbit hole too far. Um, I've, I've known people that won't write Western because they don't know what color smoke comes out of the gun. You know, so it's, it's that type of level of realism. You know, how do you know what's too far? Hmm. Well, one, <laughs> one reason people don't 
I mean, one reason like for CSI and NCIS and all those others that they show the, the uh, looking for DNA and forensics, all that taking, you know, just hours is because you can't show weeks on television. You can't. So, I mean, I guess if someone is going to go to the nth degree and say it took a couple months to get the DNA back, then you're not going to have a story that's paced very well and nobody's going to buy it. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, that's one thing. And I think too, I mean, so many people love Tom Clancy, for instance, and Clancy wants to tell you where every button and every lever and every, well, he's a good enough storyteller in amongst all of that, that you still go with the book. But I don't know how many people I know I've talked to that skim those parts because it's like, I don't need to know where the lever is. Just tell me what happens next. So I think, um, I think it's a delicate balance between too much information. And, you know, if you make them unemotional FBI agents who can never get on a plane, I'm not sure anybody's going to read it. I, I agree when I, and of course I use my husband as a technical advisor all the time. And and by editing, uh, I read it aloud to him. And, you know, he, he'll often ask, um, do you have a chapter? I feel like a cigar on the back porch. Yeah, it's, it's so, we kind of do that thing. But um, I will read particularly the Carolina Slade series since it's federal. And I will read what Slade's doing and he'd stop and he'd go, I'd never let somebody do that on one of my cases. And I'd go, okay, this is fiction. You need to help me get a, fine, a balance here between the storytelling and the reality. And he's like, I never would let her get away with that. And that agent, oh my God, you know, he should be doing this and that and the other. I'm like, take it down, take it down. You know, we got to find a medium here that, that keeps it entertaining because Slade has a little bit of a little sense of humor, a little quirkiness, and she steps across the line a time or two, which drives him crazy. He says, that would not happen in reality. I said, but we've got to have an entertaining story as well as get things right. And we run okay. into that a lot in the science fiction part of it. You know, people are always, you know, talk, especially we military sci-fi, you know, okay, we're talking about faster than light travel, which everybody can agree with, but you're going to worry about the tonnage of a ship and how big it is when it goes through the wormhole because it wouldn't work. Well, faster than light travel doesn't work either, but we got to write a story. So we do, you know, when we write a screenplay, we take a lot of creative license. You know, I want to get as much as I can right that, you know, like Jenny said, you've got to be able to tell a story in an hour and a half if you're doing a movie or an hour or a half hour. And, you know, it takes an hour and a half just to do wipe down a crime scene looking for fingerprints, much less going for DNA evidence and just pictures and everything else that's got to go with that. So, yeah, you got to step it up a little bit, make it interesting. And the average autopsy takes between two and four hours. So, you know, you're not going to show that whole thing. What? <laughs> <laughs> we do part of the reason on my second series i went with a little small place that was touristy and i mean the population 600 except in july when it leaps up to 4,000 when the tourists come in that type of thing um is that i didn't want her to have all of the forensic resources at hand i wanted her to have to think through this and not have the resources so she's you know she's falling back on her knowledge and her experience and her wiles than, than, than DNA, you know, you know, so, so um, it, it, that, that helps keep the story going forward as well. So less technical and more intuition and stuff. Okay. But even now, in real police work, there's a lot of that that goes on. I mean, you're waiting months sometimes for DNA evidence and you've got to continue on with your investigation. You still got to call people and talk to people hunt things down and, um, you know, build up informants and, you know, find a suspect. It's, it's, it's not just like the other side of it is, well, Oh, I've got this blood evidence and I throw it in there and, you know, suddenly I've got the suspect comes back and he's going to confess. Well, just nope. because you have a good DNA sample or, or something doesn't mean the guy's even in the system. You know, if he's never been in the system, it doesn't help you. It will if you find him, but you still got to find whoever did it. And that's, I mean, truly, there's so much more good old sleuthing that goes on to even to this day. That's what makes the case for the most part. And it's Everything how you interview great. and it, it's how you mm -hmm. trick somebody into saying what they need to say. It's not, uh, 
uh, my husband still contracts out on some investigations and uh, I've sat in on enough when I was working side by side with him before to know I don't have that art. You know, I mean, there, there's a there's a knack to that. There's a people skill. There's a real strong people skill there that you develop over the years. And and uh, like you were saying, so, you know, cases take a long time. I watched him do a two year serial killer case in, in hospitals and uh, and it, yeah, it consumed him. But it was slow. It's like running through mud trying to get the right people to talk and find the right people and, you know, put all the pieces together in the right order. Mm -hmm. So going back a little bit to how the law enforcement uh, departments work together, uh, one of the other questions that uh, Michael had was, do they share and interact or is it a need to know type basis between different departments, uh, say vice and homicide or, you know, any of the other. For the most part, like I said, we had a lot of multi-jurisdictional task forces. Um, you're going to have ATF, FBI, local law enforcement, sheriff's department, you know, if everybody wants to get the bad guy, whoever that is. And, you know, it makes sense sometimes for the local folks to take something and run with it. It makes a lot of sense to let, you know, to help the FBI make their case or ATF make their case or whoever it happens to be, because you'd rather that case, because of the, the nature of it, you'd rather it go federal. Or in the process of doing a, a very small investigation, I can't tell you how many times you roll someone or come up on something else. It's like, oh, man, this got huge in a hurry. Let me call my buddy over here at the FBI and say if it's something they're interested in. And if they are, you know, if you're, I'll give you an example, you know, selling cigarettes can turn into, and has around here turned into a huge investigation that, um, involving tractor trailer loads of cigarettes going up north. And at that point, you know, you get the feds involved and then come to find out they're going overseas, you know, and all that goes into, you know, so yes, we tend to work very well together. So it's not like you see on television where they say, oh no. Don't bring in the feds. We want to handle this case on our own. No, for the most part, I didn't find that to be the case. And, and I'm going to give you another one of my pet peeves, and I'll, I'll be quiet, is the, the SWAT negotiator thing, where the SWAT guy is always wanting to kick the door in and go get the bad guy, and the negotiator is always yelling, no, no, wait, wait, we want to talk, you know, we can still talk to him. It really doesn't happen. <laughs> you know, if we have to go in and get the guy, we will. But that's generally after negotiations have really broken down to the point where people are, you know, dying. Um, you know, you always want to talk someone out. You know, I always tell people you always want to talk them into the back of a police car if you can. Who wants to fight anybody? I'm too old for that. You know, so anyway, so there's not a lot of that that I found. I don't think so either. Um, I can't tell you how many cases uh, my husband had where he reached out to the locals mm -hmm. because they they were more boots on the ground have a you know inherent knowledge of the of the region or area that a federal case took him into i mean he he would invite them in in a heartbeat so i mean everybody has their specialty and just and the, you know just because you look at it as a hierarchy with the feds you know being up here it's not necessarily case. It's just different kinds of knowledge, different kinds of cases, and and sometimes you need each other, and they work well together. I've I've never heard of of in reality. I've never heard of clashes. Okay, and one last thing here. What we've talked about a pet peeve. What have you seen that someone's gotten just perfectly right, either in a book that you've read, TV or movies, uh, with the police procedural. Yeah, I'll start with uh, Jeannie. Well, in my area with funerals and autopsies and all that sort of thing, they just almost never get it right, just simply because of the time issue. Um, you can't show how right it has to go um, with the time constraints. And I'm sorry, six feet under notwithstanding, they don't get any of that stuff right. <laughs> Alas. Okay, uh, how about Hope? 
uh, frankly, I love seeing a really good interview and those aren't real common and they're not these quick things that you see. I think the Brits get that better than the Americans do. If you, if you watch British mysteries, uh, mm -hmm. you know, everything drags out and takes its time. And, and, but the, um, but watching somebody interview, it's like you throw them in a room and you, you just start hitting them with questions. And I'm sorry, there's an art to interviewing someone. Um, I was trained to do interviews so that I could pass off those interviews to agents when they came in. And uh, yeah, they're scripted. They're very much scripted until you can do it by the seat of your pants. And that takes a lot, a lot, a lot of experience. Um, so uh, when I see a good solid interview that I think have things in the right order, I'm impressed. It, it makes me sit up and take notice. I, I don't read the uh, mystery and those kind of things. I guess some people say for obvious reasons, but I, I don't know. But in movies, um, I can tell you, I love to see it when they move correctly. Um, that when they show these special operators running around with guns pointed at the air and at each other's backs and you know they're running around the corner leading with their firearms and um it's it just infuriates me and when you've got a professional police department and everybody on whatever team they happen to be on are all carrying different kinds of weapons they, they've clearly never handled one and uh and if you want to look at to see how to handle a weapon correctly watch john wick um you know keanu reeves is is trained by one of the best shooters in the nation i mean a real ipsic shooter uh, which is a, a professional uh, organizations of shooters. And um, I, it just drives me nuts when you see these guys running around holding firearms incorrectly. Um, so when they get that right, yeah, I notice. Something else, you know, um, probably Jeannie can tell you, the, um, the crime scenes smell. I don't care. They are horrific sometimes, and, and they never get that right. Mm -mm. Um, wow, you know, I mean, it's putting the Vicks up the nose, putting two or three candies in your mouth, then putting a mask on so you can go into a crime scene um, yeah. just so you can get in there and get something done. And, you know, I think that would make great TV, but you know. <laughs> you know so. Yeah, the rookie's falling over <laughs> the first time they go to a crime scene with a dead body. Oh, yes. And then they make fun of them though. You know, everybody else is like, oh, you get used to it kind of thing. And but it's crazy when they show these, uh, especially in movies and TV, and they all come up on the body that's, you know, partially decayed and nobody's going, oh, mm -hmm. <laughs> not a soul. All of them are like, wow, that's a dead body. And you're like, mm hmm, and it smells real bad, too. <laughs> so you're yeah, right, you go, Steve. Yeah, when you go up to a house and, you know, check on the welfare and all the black flies are on the inside of the house, mm, that's not a good a sign. A bad sign. <laughs> well, and one of the things that I talk about in the class I teach is that, and, and Steve, you can probably uh, attest to this, you can tell if it's a deer or a person. A human body smells completely differently than a, a decaying animal carcass. And uh, there's no, you know when it's a human body. You know, I don't know, I don't know why, you, you might be able to know why that is, but you know, it, it is a very unique smell and you can tell right away, oh, yeah. you, you're just like, damn it. <laughs> yeah, this is gonna be a while. Cause that means, you know, if you find a deer, that's cool. You know, I can yeah. go get my cup of coffee and you know, get off on time. But yeah. you roll up on a dead body that's been in the woods for a while, you, you know, we might as well, we're gonna be here a while. You're gonna be there for a second shift, yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, partly the reason it smells so bad is because we eat processed food with chemicals in it and animals don't do that. It's, it really truly is pretty much ashes to ashes with, with uh, deer and livestock and other things like that. Livestock a little bit closer to us, but um, mostly it's because we have so many chemicals in our system. We be funky. <laughs> So um, what I like to do is uh, get one actionable item that a new writer who's wanting to do things in this field that they could do today to improve their writing. And I know we've touched on it some, but 
if I can get something uh, from Hope first. Uh, I couldn't have written any of mine without going to the to a voice that's been there, done that. I if you're gonna write any kind of procedural, you got to go to somebody who's done the procedure. That's 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 the best advice I can give somebody. And Steve, I, I'm gonna have to second that. You know, there are so many people, and it's not secrets. It's just you know, don't be afraid to ask. A lot, so many people are just afraid to ask. And, you know, I saw it on TV, so I'm going to write it, you know, um, I've told people before, you know, this hostage, hostage situation that you've got going on isn't dramatic enough that you've got to all of a sudden have all this other drama going around. And I mean, that's a pretty dramatic thing when, you know, someone's got a hostage situation or something along those lines. So ask. And, uh, you know, if you don't know anything, and it's my, my thing, if you don't know anything about firearms, find out something about firearms. And, you know, people... And not the gun nuts, I'm not talking about that, but you know, most folks who are enthusiasts or things, they, they want to share their information and they want you to get it right. So I ask. Anything extra, Jeannie? Well, yeah, I, I second Steve's this, people want to get you to get it right, so ask, but also don't be afraid to take a class, uh, take a firearms class, take a class on the internet from one of these writing organizations about how to write a police procedural, go to Writer's Police Academy, you know, go get some experience, go get some information. There's, it's out there. So it's actually easy in some ways to find the information if you go looking. All right, um, I see Deborah, you've joined us. Hi, I'm sorry, I was on Central Time and I didn't do the math, so bad on me, so sorry. All right. Uh, well, if you want to introduce yourself and sure. uh, my name is Deborah Dixon and I am the publisher uh, for Bell Books and its imprints, uh, Bell Bridge Books and Imagine Books. We publish both uh, uh, mystery, uh, suspense, uh, cozy mystery, um, thriller. Uh, some of our authors are Don L. M. Bell, uh, Hope C. Clark, who's on this panel uh, today. And I I guess I've been in the industry since before Dirt, but we've been a publisher for over 20 years. And um, I've written a book called When You're the Only Cop in Town. My dad was career law enforcement, spent 17 years, uh, the last 17 years of his career as a chief of police in a small town. So that's me. Okay, well, thanks for joining us. Um... Let me ask you, uh, ask the others about this. And just first, your uh, biggest pet peeve with uh, books and film, movies, something that you see that they get wrong all the time. Um, forgetting to apply real science and real world techniques uh, in a believable way. Um, there, there's always a way that you can make a plot work uh, using real science. Um, so that's always, it makes me roll my eyes when, you know, they get DNA results in, you know, five minutes and just things like that where they completely blow past any possibility that it can be done this way. Or when characters jump to conclusions that are not supported by concrete evidence to that point. They go from point A and B to Z with nothing in between that could possibly suggest the Z result to them from A and B. So I like characters uh, who are working with real facts that lead to real logical conclusions. So it drives me crazy when they use coincidence or idiot savant techniques to get a detective to the right answer as quickly as they need them to. I believe uh, everyone will agree with that one. <laughs> oh, did I just repeat everything everybody else already said? Sorry. Oh, but you said it so well. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Hope. <laughs> All right. Um, just one other thing here. Uh, we were just getting close to wrapping up, and I just wanted to check with you, Deborah, on 
what your thoughts were on authors. Can they go too far when they are writing realism? Do you mean too much detail or too much gore or what? Trying to make it too realistic to where it slows down the story. Yes. Um, that is always the thin line that authors have to ride is how can we push the pacing? How can we keep the reader engaged while having a believable investigation? So there are some trade-offs that they have to make and there are ways to do those sort of things. But, you know, it's, I always recommend that authors try to tr stay as true to the process as possible so that readers don't roll their eyes and step back from the story and think, well, this is not possible. I can't trust this author. You never want the reader to believe that you're not reliable, that they can't settle into the story, that they have to be on guard for the things you get wrong. So there's a trade-off between writing a believable story and writing a 100% true story. So the writer's got to find that little space in there where the readers will cut them a little bit of slack, will go along with them uh, so that it's believable and they can read through instead of rolling their eyes. Once you have put so much detail in there that you slow the reader down, they're going to put the book down. Once you don't have enough detail, once it's not as believable and crisp and logical, logical flow is important, once you come to a point where you don't have logical flow or the readers know that these techniques are not possible or real, uh, then you've lost the reader on that side. So the author has to thread that needle between having the reader put the book down because it's so slow and boring and they really don't care and having uh, the reader put the book down because everything is too convenient and there's no process or procedure. And it depends on whether you're writing a cozy. There's a whole lot you can get away with in a cozy that you might not be able to get away with in a police procedural. So is it who is your audience? And then you've got a right to fit that audience expectation and that audience's level of um, believability, of, you know, of what they're going to require out of the story. Okay, so what is uh, the difference between a cozy and a police procedural? A police procedural is going to use a main character who is from some sort of law enforcement background. Um, that character could be a chief of police, as in Hope Clark's Edisto series, or they might be an administrative investigator, as Hope uses in her Carolina Slade series. Uh, neither of them are amateurs, even though one of them doesn't have a badge, they still have access to law enforcement, they're still following a case, they have, um, you know, case process, best practices that they follow, access to the people they need to, to be within a law enforcement investigation of the case, pretty much. Uh, cozy, you're going to have a complete amateur who is, through circumstances they didn't ask for, uh, have gotten involved in a murder, um, or being called upon to help clear someone that they love or is dear to them, clear the name of that person who has uh, been suspected of something and they know it's not true. Whatever this amateur who doesn't necessarily have a police background, a science background, any of these things, access to anything, they're going to follow that mystery in a different way than a police procedural will follow the mystery. In a lot of cozies, hijinks ensue. You'll find much more humor than you might find in a police procedural. Um, so basically, that's kind of the each end of the spectrum. And mysteries and suspense and cozies they, and thrillers, they all kind of slide on a continuum back and forth. But the general hallmark of a cozy is it's really settled in a world, whether it's an embroidery shop or a librarian or um, a baker. Oh, there's, there's some kind of world that comes to the story along with the character and as well as the amateur. And if somebody else disagrees or has better, please jump in and, and add to what I've just said. So you're talking like Murder, She Wrote. Yes, Murder, She Wrote. Um, we do a couple of cozies. Um, the Dogfather was, is a book from the Sparkle Abbey Girls series. Um, and uh, Jill Marie Landis has done a one set in Hawaii. 
So in the cover, the covers promise you more of a escapade and a little more humor and a little less gore than say a really dark book. It's not really dark, but I mean, you know, Don L. M. Bell, that's that's a police procedural and it, you know, they're they're not fluffy puppies and kitties in this book. So all right. Uh, now for a new writer, what would you suggest? Uh, now everyone else pretty much said ask as the option uh for what you would do to get it right in the beginning yeah uh, anything you'd like to add um for new writers there are some books out there that can be very helpful talking to other mystery writers you know make sure you're in a local group with mystery writers and talk with them if depending on the kind of book you're writing i know a lot of writers who've gone to um, police academy for citizens where you go in for you know for a certain amount of time you learn about law enforcement and you even get a ride along. So they need to put in the time and do their, their research and their work. Um, we can't all live with law enforcement like Hope does, who can turn to her husband and go, hey, dude, I, I need to Is know. Is this right? <laughs> <laughs> it's a wonderful resource, you know, lawman is great, but we don't all have that opportunity. So you got to develop those, those ties uh, to people. Uh, and uh, if people question your procedure, if they, they don't think it's right, then take a look at it again. It may just be that you've expressed it incorrectly. You, you haven't been as clear as you need to be about how it happens. Um, so, and sometimes people don't know. They'll ask a question and they, they're just checking to make sure, okay, is this okay? It seems a little odd, but I'm going to trust you if you say it's okay. That's where the believability comes in. If you build up some reader equity where they believe everything that goes along in the book, then you can get away with something that's a little shaky because they believe you. So, so do your homework, put in the time, find writers who write mystery so you can talk about killing people together. So nobody actually suspects you of actually doing it and you can go, we're all writers here. It's all good. Yes, that's right. That's right. That's right. And I'll put in a plug for your book, uh, Deb, because that's been very helpful to me as the oh, only cop you. in town. That, I recommend that to everybody. Thank you so much. Awesome. Jason, you're muted. Jason, you're muted. <laughs> oh, no. Uh, go ahead and click back on the button. OK. I was going to um, say, the inmates are about to run the asylum. <laughs> so just uh, one final question for everyone this time. Now, I know, Steve, you do not write uh, police procedurals. Although I think it could work in science fiction, uh, just even military sci-fi, it has some of the elements that you would see. But what have you never seen in any TV movie book that you've read that you would like to either try or see to help the story move forward quickly? You Sorry, stumped us all, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> you stumped us. Um, Anyone can chime in if they've got an idea. The, the, the some of this, well, I mean, they've got CSI shows. I was going to say one of my another one of my pet peeves because I told you we could do a whole hour on just those. Um, is you know people see so many things on about. You know, from CSI, they think the crime scene can come in there and take a fingerprint off a brick, for example. Um, you know, it's they just do because they I saw it on TV, and you know they can do that. You can be you'll be surprised. You know, there there are no Abbies in the lab that can get on the computer, and you know there's no back door to the FBI database. There's not you know not one to you know NSA or anything like that. You can't get in this supercomputer and find out these things. It just does not happen that way. So, and again, we're in a pet peeve of what's not right. So, you know, I, I, I see that a lot. That's one of the things I tell people in my class is that if you want to set a murder where people will get away with it, do it in a small rural area where they have no budget. <laughs> Absolutely. Nobody's, Absolutely. Yep, nobody's going to have a budget to go do fingerprinting on a leg that somebody found in the woods and see if there's a print on it. They're not going to exactly. do that. 
I and always tell not... people alligators have to eat too. And you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, but they leave evidence. It's the pigs you want. Yes. The pigs. Don't leave any evidence. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They only leave the hip joints and the skull. All right, slightly disturbed, other than the fact that everyone's a writer here. But uh, just finally, if everyone wants to tell me where people can find you uh, on the social media, uh, start with Steve. Uh, our website is Two Men and a Typewriter. It's spelled out just like it is T W O M E N and a typewriter and uh, dot com. And we write. Yeah, between Paul and I, we've written like five or six. It's we're all science fiction, science fiction, fantasy writers, um, and we write screenplays. Like I said, that uh, we have a pretty, you know, we we blog quite a bit, and unfortunately, it's just memes and things. You know, <laughs> we're just busy. But that's where you can find us: Two Men and a Typewriter, and uh, Falstaff Books is our publisher. Okay, Hope. Okay, I'm at chopeclark.com. And uh, we, I've got 10 novels out. 11th is about to come out next month. And I am about to finish up number 12. So there's always one coming out. I'm published with Bell Bridge Books. And Jeannie? Um, you can find me at JeannieAdams.com. You can find me on Twitter at, at JeannieAdams. Uh, I'm, my next one is my space adventure with Nancy Northcott. So that'll come out sometime oh. in the summer. And that's a police procedural in space. So there you go. <laughs> <laughs> and Deborah. Uh, just one quick thing. People forget that police procedural is important in science fiction and fantasy. If you're solving a mystery, you still got to do it logically. You still got to have your process. But I digress. Um, Bell Books, B-E-L-L-E -L -L -E Books or bell, B-E-L-L, -L, bridgebooks.com. That's where you're gonna find our mysteries in suspense. Um, my email is Deborah Dixon at bellbooks.com. Uh, we have a Facebook page uh, and, uh, you know, just reach out. All right, I wanna thank everyone for coming in and this has been the panel room, uh, Police Procedurals. Thanks everyone. And I'm sorry. <laughs> Good to see you again, Dan.